How's everybody doing? My name is David Valancourt, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing here at the University of Florida. So we're here in Gainesville, Florida. Last night I flew in on a, a flight from the Parkinson's Disease Foundation in New York. Um, I was very privileged to be with Stan Fawn, who's a very famous neurologist. I come here, and there's Joe Jankovic, and you have Michael Oaken, and and uh, Nick McFarland, all these other sort of very famous uh, neurologists here. So it's very, very uh, humbling for me to get to be here with you guys today. So um, we're here in Gainesville, um, and, and the University of Florida is here in Gainesville, and, it, and it's known for a lot of things. And one of the things that's really cool about the University of Florida is, is it's, a, it's a very good university. It's, it's right now, it's about the 14th ranked university in, in the U.S. And, and as far as uh, public universities go. And you think about what is famous about the University of Florida, one thing that's famous is Gatorade, right? So everybody sort of recognizes the University of Florida for Gatorade. Um, and, and there are also a lot of other cool things at the University of Florida that, that are also recognized um, at, at, the, at the university. And one of those is, is MRI. So I, not many of you might know, but there's what is called the High Field Magnet Lab, which basically is looking at research in, in tissues and also uh, in, li, in vivo animals and also in humans and developing new ways to look at MRIs in, in people so that we can sort of improve the way that diagnostics occur and also uh, looking at new interventions. And so about th three and a half to four years ago, I was in Chicago, and it's freaking cold in Chicago. I don't know if you know that. Um, but I moved here uh, from Chicago, and we moved for sunshine. And I have three daughters, and those are there on the right. And, and they're very happy now that we live in, in Florida instead of in Chicago. Um, so I, I want to answer one question for you. Why study the progression of Parkinson's disease? Why do we care about this? And I want to tell you that this is about the future, I think, of the way that medications will be tested in the future. And so um, right now, medications are tested on symptoms. They're tested, you give a drug, and about 60 minutes later, and many of you know this, you start feeling a little bit better and you start moving a little bit better, or the tremors get a little bit lower, or you turn the DBS off or you turn it on and you see performance change. But in many ways in the future, uh, for Parkinson's disease, it's going to move to more of a model, I think, which is more similar to the way cancer is treated, to the way multiple sclerosis is treated, or the way cholesterol in heart disease is looked at. It's going to basically be using measurements of biology and testing a drug on that biolog biological measure rather than testing it on symptoms. And you might ask, well, why do you, why do you care about this? Well, there's a great episode on 60 Minutes recently, um, which was looking at um, glioblastoma, which is a very devastating uh, cancer of the brain. And this particular uh, study, uh, which is being performed at Duke University, is basically injecting the polio vaccine into the brain and injecting it right into the tumor. But the reason I think it's important for you guys, or for our own research, is because what they're looking at, they're not looking at the patient to see how the patient's doing. I mean, they are. But they're also looking at the MRI. And the MRI is telling them if the treatment is working or not. Okay, And that's really cool because that's very different from the way that we are doing it in the area of Parkinson's disease. And so basically they would look, and on the left there you would see the tumor, and then on the right is what is happening to the tumor only weeks after they injected the polio vaccine. And what they noticed in some of the individuals in the study, after a period of long-term uh, treatment with the, with the vaccine, the tumor is basically going away. And it, it's, a, it's an amazing particular therapy. Whether it's going to work in a larger scale a number of individuals is still a very open question, but it's a very interesting idea. And it basically suggests a way to sort of model looking at Parkinson's disease in the future. And so this is the way that MRIs are currently used in Parkinson's disease. You look at the image and you say, well, you don't have a stroke, you don't have a tumor, you're fine, you must have something else. Um, and, and so there's nothing on it right now that tells you that you might have Parkinson's disease, or there's nothing on it that tells you that a drug might alter that particular image. So right now the MRI is really te teasing out things rather than helping you identify something. And what I want to suggest to you is that that, that might change in the future. Okay, so another example is, is cholesterol. So m most people, a lot of Americans, are, are on cholesterol-lowering drugs, and, and the idea is you, is you have a blood test, uh, you check to see if you have a high cholesterol, and if you do, then you basically have a cholesterol-lowering drug. About three to six months later, you go back to the doctor, and they check your cholesterol, and it's hopefully a little bit better, right? And so that's another way that you measure a biological marker. You test the drug on that biological marker rather than symptoms, because at point one and point two, the patient looks the same in those particular instances. Whether you uh, have high cholesterol or low cholesterol, you look the same. It's just that something in your body is, is doing a little bit better, and the medication is helping your body and basically preventing the risk of heart disease is basically 
basically what it's doing. And so the idea is to sort of move to a model like that in, in, the, in the area of Parkinson's disease. And so the, the area of the brain that, which is really important in Parkinson's disease is dopamine and, and the dopaminergic neurons, which are in an area called the substantia nigra. It's, it's deep in the midbrain, deep, deep in the brain. And basically that's an area of the brain that's producing a lot of the dopamine that is utilized. And, and it's actually the lack of dopamine in, in Parkinson's disease is really what is a problem. And so med most of the medications that are being used today are basically trying to uh, sort of ramp up the dopamine that's available uh, within the brain and help you uh, move better. And so what we're trying to do is develop an MRI technique which might be able to visualize this in the human brain. Basically visualize changes in dopaminergic neurons or changes in the structural features around dopaminergic neurons as the progression of Parkinson's disease occurs. So we can track it, visualize it, and test new therapies on it. So John Lennon once told us all to imagine. And so the, the idea is to imagine what, what would this look like. Well, one way that it might look is to actually see the changes in the progression of this marker within the substantia nigra. And, and I'll tell you right now that, that I think we've, we've developed a technique which actually can do at least partially this or at least get, get a, do a pretty good job of visualizing it. And so on the left is the sort of typical caricature of, of a progression of a person with Parkinson's disease. On the right is, is actual data. And so the, the blue that you see there on the, the two different images is the, the substantia nigra. And that, as that blue lights up more, that's basically showing you that what you have is an elevation of water content in that particular part of the brain. And, and I'm going to submit to you today that that elevation of that water content may be indicative of changes going on in dopaminergic neurons within the substantia nigra. And that elevation of water content is actually probably not a good thing, and it may be something that we want to track and potentially try to treat uh, in the future. Okay, so I'm going to try to tell you four, four things. I'm going to try to tell you first, what is accumulation of, of water content in, in the brain, and how are we measuring it? I'm going to try to give you a little sense of that. Second thing I'm going to do is tell you how it's affected in Parkinson's disease. The third thing I'm going to do is tell you how it changes with the progression of Parkinson's disease. And the fourth thing I want to do is share with you a study that, that we've done previously, which is the longest randomized clinical trial of a particular type of exercise intervention in Parkinson's disease. Okay? So first, what is sort of free water accumulation? What is this water accumulation uh, uh, that is occurring? And essentially what you see here is a bunch of different brain images. The one on the left is the typical type of MRI that is used by most radiologists today. It's called a T1 weighted image and it basically means that it's, it's weighted for a particular type of contrast. And you can't actually see things very well and you can't see deep structures all that well in this image. You can see some things but you can't see other things. And other types of MRIs, what is called diffusion MRI, which you see here in the, in the colored ones, you can start seeing some of the features of the brain that you can't see on the other type of MRI. And basically what that allows you to do is it allows you to sort of look at the diffusion of water molecules within the brain and, and measure the diffusion of water molecules. And so if you look at the, the, the middle slide here, you see a bunch of cells, okay, just a bunch of cells. And, and water is, is within those cells and, and outside of those cells. And the water can diffuse in different ways. And basically, as we think that as Parkinson's disease is getting worse and is progressing, the fluid content outside of those cells is, we think it might be increasing. And it might be increasing for a number of reasons. And, and basically what we're trying to do is measure the, the, the fluid content or the water content outside of the cells in a deep part of the brain that is really important uh, for Parkinson's disease. Okay, so in the, in the basal ganglia, you have what's called the substantia nigra, okay? And, and, and it has probably a little bit of elevation of free water or, or water content. And I've told you that, but now I'm gonna try to convince you and show you the studies that actually show that, okay? So what we do is we take MRIs, it's, it's, a, it's a standard MRI, it's a, the standard three Tesla type MRI, it's, it's a little confined, it's not much fun to be in, um, but it's a typical type of MRI that you would have at a, in an academic hospital. Um, and basically you lie there for about 10 minutes, um, and in that particular environment you don't do anything, you're actually sort of looking at the structural features of, of the brain during that particular uh, instance. And what we're basically doing in that instance is, is partitioning the amount of variance going on within a particular voxel in the brain and trying to assess how much water content is, is, is in there. And so what we find is, if you look at the upper left-hand corner uh, of this slide, we find that people with Parkinson's disease have an elevation of water content um, in that particular part of the substantia nigra, uh, which is really the part of the substantia nigra which has been shown um, 
uh, and people who have uh, passed away before, that, that that's the part of the brain that's really the part of the brain that is losing dopaminergic neurons. So we're looking at the exact part of the brain that is really relevant to, to Parkinson's disease. So you might say, oh, okay, that's all well and good, but does it relate to the things that we care about, like how we move and how we think? And, and so the next slide basically shows you the relation between the water content, which is on the y-axis of all of these slides, on the left side, and on the, the bottom of the slides is cognition, which is on the left, and motor symptoms, which is on the right. And all the slide basically shows you is that the water content in the substantia nigra is related to how you think, and it's also related to how you move. Basically, the higher amount of water content, the worse off cognition is, and the higher amount of water content, the uh, worse off your movements are. And so basically what that suggests is that uh, it might be worth thinking about uh, measuring that water content as people progress to see if it is changing as people progress through, through the, the course of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so uh, another thing <coughs> to think about is, is so that's just, just at the University of Florida. Well, well, what happens if you start measuring this at more than one MRI unit? And so uh, there's a Michael J. Fox Foundation has funded a very large initiative called the uh, Parkinson's Progressive Marker Initiative, the PPMI. Okay, it's a very expensive project. And basically across many sites across the world, they're, they're testing blood, they're testing spinal fluid, they're testing urine, they're testing brain MRIs, and they're trying to find markers of progression. And so what we did was we took their data and we asked the question, can we measure that free water in the data that they've acquired and see if we get the same finding, okay? Because if we do, then that means that we're able to replicate our finding in another uh, study, and then that means that what we've measured actually might be a reliable marker. And so that's what we did, and, and the data here that you see, the upper left-hand corner, I know it looks like the University of Florida data, but it's actually the, uh, the PPMI, Michael J. Fox data, and it basically shows you that there is a, a higher amount of that water content in the substantia nigra, uh, very, very similar to what we found in the University of Florida data set. And so what that suggests is that part of the substantia nigra it seems to have that elevation of free water or that water content, and it, and it may be very uh, detrimental um, and very indicative of something uh, that needs to be corrected. Okay, so now I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the progression study that we, we've done to ask the question, does the water content in that part of the substantia nigra change as the progression of Parkinson's disease occurs? And if we were able to measure that, that would be very, very important because then you can test new therapies or disease-modifying therapies to determine if it's altering the course of the way that the substantia nigra is changing over time just like you can test to see if cholesterol or cholesterol-lowering drugs is altering the way cholesterol is changing over time, okay? Because then you have a, a marker or a measurement that you can reliably evaluate therapies going forward. And so uh, our lab is part of what is called the Parkinson's Disease Biomarker Program. It's funded by the federal government and the National Institutes of Health, and it's basically 11 different sites in the United States, um, all, all in different areas, and, and basically, uh, we're, we're sharing data with a lot of different uh, groups. It's all de-identified. So people in our studies, you don't know, you know who it is when it gets shared. It's all sort of stripped of any identifiers. But the idea is that we're all working together as a big team trying to understand any sort of markers that might be relevant um, in the field and, and so that we can also replicate them amongst each other. And so this is a very important initiative funded by the federal government um, to sort of study Parkinson's disease. And so what you see here in this graph is the healthy individuals. So we had a control group in the study um, of healthy people who don't have Parkinson's disease, and you can see that their water content and their substantia nigra is not changing with the progression or over one year of having uh, uh, the, the measurements taking. But when you look at the patients with Parkinson's disease, you can see the water content is going up in the substantia nigra just after one year, okay? And what that suggests is that we're able to reliably measure that water content in the substantia nigra, and, and it's likely indicative of very, something very important going on uh, with the disease process. Now, the, the next thing that we asked was, can we predict, if we measure it at time point one, can we predict changes in their, their motor functions after that, as that next year progresses, okay? Because it's a really important question. If you can predict what's going to happen to them physically the next year, then if you can alter what goes on at baseline, then you may be able to alter the course of that progression the next year, okay? And so what this graph shows you is that either males and females, that the, the, the free water measurements that we had at the baseline measurement actually predicted how, how their physical movements occurred the next year. 
okay? And so basically the higher the free water content at baseline, the faster the rate of progression uh, of, their, of their physical status got worse the next year. Okay? And so what this suggests um, is that we're actually able to predict the change in physical function um, after, after a year. And so you might ask the question, well, can you predict the change in cognitive function the next year, okay? Um, does this measure actually also relate to cognitive function? I showed you it did a little bit earlier cross-sectionally across individuals, but if you might want to also track it in the same individuals, okay? And in this particular study, um, it, it basically also relates to, to the cognitive status. So on the, on the, on the what is called the x-axis here in the middle, uh, is, is the uh, free water content in the substantia nigra and basically is related to how people were thinking or the quality of their thinking. And so as that free water measurement got uh, higher, um, the, the rate of progression of their cognitive uh, status got a little bit worse. Okay? And so what that suggests is that um, two things. One, um, when that water content in the substantia nigra is high, it seems to suggest that those people are going to maybe progress a little bit faster the next year, motorically or physically, and they're also going to progress a little bit faster the next year uh, cognitive-wise. And so that seems to potentially be a good measurement, potentially a good measurement, for evaluating new therapies in the future. Okay, so what can you do about it? So, you know, I've told you about things that might help people uh, 10 to 15 years down the road. So, so you know, it's, it's um, what can you do about it now? And, and I think Meredith sort of hit on this uh, big time, okay? And one thing that you can do now is you can exercise now, okay? You can actually exercise. And so uh, there's two ways to, to, there's a lot of different ways to exercise, but, but I'll tell you one way that I've seen and I think is the, the best, to me is the best data in the field, um, and it, it's a, it's a two-year randomized clinical trial looking at resistance training, and basically lifting weights, okay? Um, and you should do this, you know, if you were ever to do this, you would want to do it with a therapist or with a, certainly a trained individual to help you sort of work through a program like this. And basically what we did was we took um, individuals with Parkinson's disease, we had two different groups, okay, and we followed them over a two-year period of time. And, and basically they did 24 months uh, of exercise. They were put into one group, which was basically a, a pamphlet, which is actually handed out by the National Parkinson's Foundation. So we use that, what is called Fitness Counts. We use that exercise program. And then we had a resistance training program, which is basically lifting weights. And it was a whole body program. So upper body, lower body, axial muscles, um, and, and basically um, had them sort of physically work out. And the reason we did this was because we have previously done studies and shown that when people produce high amounts of forces with their hands that they actually activate and, and actually increase the blood flow to the parts of the brain that are affected in Parkinson's disease. So we had a real sort of biological rationale for looking at, at, this, at this training program. And so basically people did this two times a week, about 90 minutes per session. They did it with a trainer for the first six months to every two days, and then after that they did, the trainer showed up for one day a week. So there were 11 uh, resistance training exercises um, that they did. They also did a little bit of stretching at the beginning um, and, then, and then did all these different exercises. Um, and, and it included, as I mentioned, upper body, axial, or sort of postural type muscles, and also your lower body uh, muscles as well. And I just want to show you the data from that study, and then I'm going to uh, stop. Um, so basically, this, um, this is really important. So on the x-axis is uh, month, okay? So six, uh, 12, 18, and 24 months. The y-axis is the clinical rating scale. Many of you probably do this. It's the UPDRS, which is basically the, tap, the finger tapping, the hands back and forth, the walking, the standing up out of a chair. Um, and basically, it's, a, it's that scale that measures all those different things. Okay? And the green up there is what is thought of a typical progression of Parkinson's disease. Just a few points on that scale a year is what is thought to occur. Okay? So the black that you see up here is the control group. It's actually what is called the fitness counts group. And what you can see is after about six months, that group got better. Okay? And then they went back to their baseline. All right? So basically they got a little bit better here, and then they went back to their baseline. But you can see they're still doing better than the green. Okay? There's, even though they're not doing what I would say is the better exercise program in this case, they're still doing better than what typical progression would look like. Right? So they're, they're already still kind of beating the norm, if you will. Um, and then if you look at the resistance training group, which is the red line here, um, they basically got better, and then they sustained that benefit um, over a two-year period. Okay? And so they did much better than the control group, and they sustained that benefit. So they actually, um, uh, 
they, they basically controlled their symptoms uh, for a, a very long period of time, okay? So two years is a very long period of time to sustain that benefit. Um, and basically, um, if anybody is interested in this particular program, I can tell you about it or I can share it with Meredith and she can also tell you about it as well. So I just want to summarize. I've, I've shown you a lot of different data, but I want to tell you that I've shown you three things, okay? One is that uh, people with Parkinson's disease seem to have an elevation of water content in the substantia nigra, and that seems to be uh, increasing with the progression over one year of the disease. And I, and I suggest to you that that actually may be a good marker going forward of testing new therapies, okay? And if you take anything away from this talk, I want you to take away of why that's important. And it's important because it's a, it's a different way of basically testing therapies, similar to the way it's done in cancer, similar to the way it's done in, in MS, or similar to the way it's done in, in heart disease. And then the third thing I would just want you to take away is, is that this resistance training program, it's the longest uh, exercise study out there. Um, it's, it, it was a random clinical trial and it, and it showed that one of the best e efficacy for controlling uh, symptom uh, over a long period of time in people with PD. So I, I just want to thank um, people that work in our group. Um, our, our lab is funded by the federal government as well, the National Institutes of Health, so um, I want to thank uh, them as well. Uh, thank foundations that also support our work and thank you all very much uh, for your attention. I don't want to hold you from lunch.